Um, thank you for coming and welcome uh, today on Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, we are very, very happy and lucky to have uh, our panelists, who I'll introduce now, um, Rebecca LeClaire, who is the chair of the Metroline and Native American Association and is on the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs. Uh, we have Jesse Jacobs, who is, uh, his, the number of affiliations he has is incredibly long. The ones he has chosen to highlight for tonight include the North Carolina Indian Senior Citizen Coalition and the International Minority Coalition. Uh, Isabel Lanford, uh, who is a recent graduate of high school, not of South Point High School, because of the mascot, and who is currently a first year at American University, and will be moderated by Richard Boyce, uh, who uh, was the mayor of Belmont and has uh, been a preacher at First Presbyterian, I want to say. There's a lot of Presbyterian churches. Um, okay, so thank you and welcome to our panel. Um, I hope you've already uh, introduced yourself in the chat. If not, please take a minute and say who you are. We'd like to get to know everyone. Um, what we're going to do tonight is is this presentation and then the film screening and then the, the breakout rooms and then a panel so you'll, you'll have time to talk with each other. But first I want to go over who we are. Um, we're a coalition of students, teachers, alumni, community members, and Native leaders. And all those people are, are, are represented uh, here tonight working to retire the South Point High School's offensive right rear mascot. We are committed to removing names, logos, and actions, appropriate actions that perpetuate negative stereotypes about Native people, and to working with the community to choose a mascot that better represents the values of inclusivity and unity that Belmont and South Point aspire to. Uh, hopefully that's pretty clear. Uh, right, so after we watch the uh, excerpt from the film, there'll be a small discussion. We're gonna break you into, into groups of four or five people. Um, and then we're going to come back and hear from our panel, hear their thoughts, uh, and hopefully there'll be time at the end to, uh, for you to kind of share back and, and maybe reflect on what you've heard from the panel. Um, so this film is specifically about the Washington team. So there is a little bit um, emphasis on why the particular name of this team is incredibly offensive, uh, which uh, is not identical to what's going on at Raiders, but, but the underlying issues of who gets to represent who and who decides what is of an honor and, and what is not, those are really, really the same and it's, it's a really uh, great film. Um, so there's a few questions we thought we would uh, suggest for you to think about. Uh, first is, um, about the name and the, the image. Uh, does it honor indigenous people? Uh, people who are a fan of the name will say this is to honor, honor people. What are other ways we could think about honoring indigenous people? Another is um, the word red in Red Raider. How is it, is it connected to the racial slur that we are not going to say? How, uh, and just how is that word used? Um, why is it important that Native identity is defined politically and legally as well as through ancestry? What does that mean for people who are or are not Indian? Uh, and, and really anything else, there's a lot going on in the film. So if there's something else that you wanted to talk about, please do so and let us know. Um, but those are the three we thought we would kind of guide you towards. Okay, so we are going to open the breakout rooms now for about 15 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I was worried about length tonight, and I said 15 minutes in a breakout session, but our group just got started uh, before we had to come back. And uh, a lot of passion, um, a lot of shared history, uh, and a lot of pain and hope that maybe uh, change is finally going to come. But one of the members said, this is a marathon. And uh, that was voiced from deep experience uh, as an African-American in our community. So I think we need to settle in for the long haul. And uh, our three 
panelists <laughs> know that far better than I and many of us on this screen. It's a deep privilege. Uh, I've had the opportunity to have some uh, interviews already with uh, Jesse and Rebecca and uh, Isabella. You've been on the front lines of some of this uh, controversy here in Gaston County, so it's a deep honor to be with you. I thought I'd just start off by asking our panelists for any quick responses uh, you had to the film and perhaps that arose out of your breakout sessions. Just a quick response, Jesse, Rebecca, Isabella. Um, I noticed that, I think that the scenes that gauged the most emotional response were those that depicted, um, you know, random white people at games and headdresses. And I, I too felt like seeing people in the full, the full Native American costume that they use, the headdress, the face paint, that was what really sparked more anger. And it got me to thinking why it takes a headdress for someone to recognize the wrong and dressing up as another race. Um, I think that especially that one scene where it where it interviewed the man in the headdress saying it's not a racist symbol I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> um, it's just really interesting how the physical attributes of certain Native American culture can really spark um, change in people I think that I see significantly less um, Act, action when it comes to changing the South Point mascot in discussions where um, I'm not telling them about concrete experiences I've had uh, with people dressing up in like headdresses at games. It takes um, it takes a lot for people to be convinced. Thank you, Isabella. Uh, already, I think many of you are aware one of the first responses to folks angry about this movement. Uh, on our screen is to say, well, we'll ban some of the more offensive uh, practices from a uh, Lineberger Stadium. But Isabella, you're saying while the headdress uh, sort of particularly uh, spurs your uh, reaction, uh, it goes much deeper than that. Rebecca or Jesse, any quick comments about uh, your response to the film? Um, I mean, the film is excellent and everything that it says is practically how I feel. I think the biggest takeaway for me <clears throat> was listening to Amanda Blackhorse and um, just her fight and how she felt. Um, you could tell it just practically drained, drained her when she was fighting this battle. And I think that's the biggest takeaway is just the energy it takes for Indigenous people to constantly have to put up with this. Yeah. and the energy it takes to constantly talk about this. So that's the biggest takeaway I, I took from that. I could feel her energy and I could feel her pain. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Richard, this, this, this is Jesse. Yeah, Jesse, I've never known you to be at a loss of words. Jump in here. <laughs> uh, thank you anyway. Uh, <laughs> I agree with both of the ladies there, what they said, uh, and I'm a, a, a victim of the circumstances from back in the 60s, uh, whenever we couldn't do anything, couldn't go to movies, couldn't go to restaurants, couldn't go into rest, restrooms, we were barred just completely, and so I know what they went through, and it was tough, I mean, if I hadn't left home, I probably wouldn't be here today, put it that way. Thank you, Jesse, you shared some of your stories with me and I hope uh, more on uh, the screen will get that opportunity moving forward. Just a quick uh, question. Uh, we talked some about comparisons with the N-word and the R-word. Uh, I must confess that I got a little nervous when I heard the statement about red uh, being okay. Uh, I, I just wondered what our panelists, uh, how you respond to the notion that the red designation may be all right, but it's the pairing with skin that makes it offensive. Any, any comment from y'all? And I, then I'm gonna get into some broader questions. Isabel. I mean, we talk, you know, I mean I'll go ahead and start just by saying, we talked about that in our breakout room. And 
<clears throat> I mean, I agree. I think that was Amanda who said that. I mean, I agree with that. The word red does not bother me personally, and I don't think it bothers a lot of Native Americans. That's how we sort of talk about ourselves, you know, but we're not talking about <clears throat> our skin is red. Um, and the red skin was totally different. That was just killing, killing Native Americans. <clears throat> so red, along with other words, does make a big difference on this. And when it comes to Red Raiders, they're using that um, to just, you know, to be negative about it. That they, they, They're painting the Indian red on Red Raiders. That's, that's the offensive part. That leads to them being in the, in the stands doing the offensive gestures. So the red part is not offensive to Native Americans. Um, and I'm not speaking for all Native Americans, but I agree with what Amanda was saying on that. It's the things that comes with the red and people just, just, just not educated when it comes to the indigenous ways and the way Native Americans are in our culture. And that's where it all just gets confusing a little bit to non-natives. But the red part, we use it a lot. Um, just like she said on the different um, organizations that are with the red. Um, but again, it does come back to what's added to the red part. And I hope that makes sense on that. But I think we've talked about that before. The, the Red Raiders being painted totally red. Um, that's just, that's not good. That's not what we mean when we mention the word red in our culture. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Go ahead, Isabel. So um, obviously I can't claim any sort of uh, discrimination based on skin color, but um, I do know that uh, historically, while red has been used to refer to Native Americans because of the general color of their skin, it has also been used in reference to scalping or the blood that's come from scalping. So I would argue that red is inherently a savage term uh, used to as a derogatory term for Native Americans. Um, I'm not saying that uh, I assume it offends a widespread group of Native Americans, but I am saying that its origins aren't kind. <laughs> Thank you, Isabella. All right, let me, um, let me broaden this out a little bit. Uh, one of the big themes in our breakout room and one of the themes later in the film, uh, and a theme I heard on... Uh, uh, all things considered just this afternoon is the theme of indigenous peoples invisibility. Uh, they were quoting a professor at Amherst this afternoon who said in her church history class, uh, well, in elementary school, she had the Indians at Thanksgiving, a brief mention of the Trail of Tears uh, in American history, and then basically indigenous peoples disappeared from the story. Uh, this film put it this way, uh, allowing uh, others to play at being Indians. This is with reference to sporting uh, rituals, allowing uh, others to play at being in Indians doesn't allow indigenous people to be alive today. Um, the rituals, the gestures, uh, become a summary of a people that you <laughs> almost disappeared <laughs> and, uh, and allow the remainder of the population to forget that as we see tonight, uh, we have indigenous people, Native Americans here in our midst and quite a few of them. Uh, what, just a quick response to that, how, how do these practices and mascots, cause we hear a lot of people arguing that these mascots and practices uh, help us to remember uh, the Native American history. But uh, how do you respond to the argument that in fact it increases indigenous people's invisibility today? Anybody? And just briefly quote the woman from the video. Uh, you can't force honor. 
Thank you, Isabel. I saw in the chat room that a lot of people responded to that. Uh, it's not up to other people to impose on or on someone else and to interpret their story and appropriate their history. I know you've got feelings about this, Jesse, and then uh, Rebecca. Jesse? Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Isabel on, on that part there, too. And, and the, the thing of it is that, that the mascot was, a mascot's not going to hurt nothing. It's, it's, it can't hurt nothing. It's what goes behind the mascots what hurts things. Uh, when you're going out there, and I, this is not my first rodeo with, with the uh, Belmont School up there, Anita, by the way. I was involved in it in 2015 real bad, too. Life-threatening and everything else. But uh, I went to one of their football games, and they were out there saying, kill the Indian, scrap the Indian, and things like that. That's what hurts more than anything else is the way you portray the Indian. Thank you, Jesse. Rebecca? This this theme of invisibility and how these practices um, allow people to forget we have fellow citizens and neighbors who are Native Americans here in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I mean, I totally agree with that statement. Um, doing those gestures in a in the sports arena, it doesn't keep us visible at all. I think, especially as Native Americans today. I think if we had to poll uh, all of the United States, they would still believe Native Americans are probably don't exist. And that's exactly, and that if we do exist, that we're running around with a tomahawk or we're savages or some type of way that's portrayed in the stadium. So doing those gestures in the stadium like that, it's just everybody's watching on TV. So they're still thinking that's who Native Americans are. They're not seeing us as everyday citizens who, who are educated people and just literally living beside you every day. They're just keeping us invisible as what the history books have, have told everyone. Thank you. Rita, I think we have to do, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? It's a Julia Young. Yes. I think we have to do a better job at educating our children. We have to do a better job of teaching children and starting at an early age and teaching them about Native people and about what we have contributed to our society. When we talked about the headdress, high school kids, elementary kids, adults, they don't know what a headdress is and what, the, what that means to Native people. They don't, they don't know that. So where do, how, we, it begins with, Really, it begins with teaching children beginning at a very early age, and it begins with us as parents and in, your, in our communities, and the opportunity is always there to uh, enlighten other people about who we are. We're not invisible only if we choose to be invisible. You know, we, yes, we are dinosaurs if we choose to be dinosaurs. That is a choice, and I think that's where we as Native people have to, have to put ourselves out there boldly. Thank you, Julia, for that passionate Greg, speech. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, Greg Richardson is online here, I see, and I wish he would say something about this. All right. You've been pushed forward, Greg. You got a word to say? Okay. Thank you. I was, I was uh, not sure if you were ready for the uh, visitors to make a comment. It looks like it's um, broadening um, out. <laughs> Welcome aboard. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, it is Indigenous Peoples Day in North Carolina. And I've got my Indigenous Peoples shirt on today. And uh, the governor of North Carolina has pro proclaimed today as Indigenous people in our state. That has been a long-standing practice in our state. And I think uh, that is because we have Indian leaders like Jesse and Rebecca and many others in our state who uh, uh, make sure that our state uh, leaders are informed about American Indians and are held accountable. So. Uh, you know, it pleases me to see this group uh, uh, speaking out tonight on the mascot issue and, and to educate others. I don't know what form, uh, if this uh, discussion is being recorded, if it can be shared on YouTube or some other form. 
but there's a, a lack of, uh, as someone just mentioned, lack of educational opportunities out there. I mean, in our communities, we are, have the largest powwows in, in the Southeast. Uh, North Carolina has eight tribes here and four urban associations. And until COVID hit, uh, all this year, we would have seen uh, our culture uh, exhibited and celebrated throughout the state of North Carolina. And so it's through uh, Teams and Zoom and forums like this now uh, through which we can continue to celebrate that, uh, uh, that heritage and that culture. So um, the, the last point I do want to make is that uh, we in America uh, have a lot to be thankful for in terms of our freedoms. And we have a lot of contributions that American Indians have made to the state and this nation. And uh, I wish there was some way we could get more visibility in terms of uh, discussions like you had mentioned earlier about the NPR discussion. I heard that, uh, listening on to that one uh, tonight as well. Some very powerful information flowing. And I've challenged NPR to do more of that type of airing because they have a, a, a strong opportunity there uh, in that UNC system to provide an education. Uh, it's good to have discussions about Indians in other states but there's just so many stories that need to be told about the American Indians and native people of this state around North Carolina. So I've challenged NPR to consider that. And they have asked me to uh, help them uh, with some subject matter, and I'm willing to do that. Uh, and I, I would encourage others to do the same as well, because it can't be just a voice from the Indian Commission. It can't be just a voice from Greg Richardson. It takes communities we like right where this subject has evolved from to make things happen. So thank you all again for pulling together this forum. It's very powerful. Thank you, Greg and Julia for joining in on the panel. My, my next question was uh, with regard to Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and heretofore, this has been Columbus Day. It's a strange sort of juxtaposition of two events. Um, I, I just wonder if some of the rest of the panel uh, wants to speak about that movement away from Columbus Day and towards Indigenous Peoples Day. Any, any wisdom to share there? Rebecca? I don't have much wisdom to say except that it needs to be changed. Um, it's been too long. Um, but it's hard when you have the president sitting out a Columbus Day proclamation like he did. Um, that's just, it was just sad to re read that proclamation that he did for Columbus Day. But, I mean, it needs to be changed. I mean, it's crazy that we're still recognizing a man who didn't claim or find anything, but except that he was lost. So it just blows my mind that we're still dealing with this in 2020. It's, it's sad in a way. <clears throat> it's sad for Native Americans. It's sad for Americans to keep honoring a man who was lost. All right. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you really think there, Rebecca. Bless you. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, uh, yeah. Isabella. I want, I want to say something real quick for you, Isabella. Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree, with, I agree with Rebecca on that, and, and if, if any of you guys haven't read anything about Christopher Columbus, please do. Read about what he have done, and then your mind will change. If, you, if it haven't already, it will change. Thank you. Jesse, Isabella, any comment? Yeah, I think that uh, replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day would be really monumental for Indigenous people in North Carolina. I know they've done it in other states. I guess they haven't implemented that here yet, although that's not the biggest surprise. Um, I think it would be really good uh, along that same vein of just increasing awareness of Indigenous people. I don't know if you guys read the chat, but I said I've met multiple people throughout my short lifetime who thought genuinely thought Native Americans were extinct. Um, I think that making a statewide holiday uh, would be really good for the Native community, if for anything, just to raise awareness. All right, I'll, I'll open it. Let me, let me take this one last uh, 
uh, question here. I, I had written it, uh, how can non-Indigenous people see, meet, and get to know Indigenous people here in North Carolina? Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with a sort of paradox. On the one hand, uh, I continually hear education, and yes, I think we're all united, and Jesse's talked long and hard about his attempts to introduce uh, more full-fledged uh, history of the indigenous peoples in our area into the school curriculum, and we desperately need that. But I'm also just flummoxed by this other lack of knowledge and experience, and that's the reality. Let's, let's look on our screen. The reality of flesh and blood indigenous people, Native Americans that are our neighbors and our fellow citizens and leading very similar lives and struggles with the rest of us. So uh, I, I worry sometimes that, um, I, and it's peculiar to me, y'all respond to this, how, how, how is, can it happen that even greater knowledge of Native American history back in the days of the European invasion of this country, still oftentimes allows people to think that those same Native Americans are now extinct <laughs> and not with us still. I, I, I can't wrap my head around uh, that part of this story. Uh, we talked about it in our breakout groups, we're coming to terms with our history, with, uh, our African-American sisters and brothers, uh, a history that we've submerged. But uh, everybody seems to be aware that our African-American sisters and brothers are still with us and our neighbors and our fellow citizens. But I, I just, I'm, I'm still confused by how even learning Native American history can sometimes allow people to forget that this is not past history, it's present history. Uh, just a, a final thing and then we'll see what other questions. Uh, Rebecca, you wanna go first? Um, I, think part, I think part of that is, I won't say we put blame on ourselves, but Native, we're such a small population. That's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people still don't realize we're here because we're so small. Number two, Native Americans are very private people. Um, you don't have many who are very outspoken, who are like myself, my flagpole includes the U.S. flag plus a Native flag. You don't have many Native Americans who are just, you know, boastfully saying I'm Native American mainly because that's going to follow up with a bunch of questions that are crazy. Do you live in a teepee? I didn't know you were still here. So I think that's, that's some of the problems because why we're so, not so much, I would have to say we're, we're private people. Um, and I think that's just generational trauma that makes us, and historical trauma that makes us that, that way when it comes to being private. And I think that's some of the reasons why even older people who are not school age still don't realize that Native Americans are here. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Rebecca. Jesse, Greg, uh, Richard, you're not quite as quiet. Jesse, go ahead. Oh, who, who is that? Greg, go ahead, yeah, Greg. I want Greg to go first. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> well, I, I think <clears throat> uh, a great deal of what we're dealing with uh, in our state and in our nation, I think North Carolina is doing a lot better uh, uh, here as far as the education piece than a lot of other states. We have a very large American Indian education program here in, in the state, but that's not enough. Uh, the issue that I have is that we, uh, uh, the history of America and our state didn't start uh, with the arrival of, of Columbus. You know, uh, he says that he discovered America. We said that he was lost, as Rebecca said, and uh, we took him at his word, he was lost. But America started uh, with our native population in this country. And if we look at the curriculums in our state, uh, both the uh, uh, public school system and the uh, academic system, there's very little there 
in terms of a teaching about the American Indian history in our state. And that, that, that is where I think the, the problem really lies. So as a student going into elementary school all the way to graduating four-year college, there's very little in terms of opportunities to learn about our population. So the, you know, there's no reason to, for that, I think. I, I think it should be uh, uh, capitalized. It should be something that there should be uh, curriculums in elementary, middle school, high school, college, all in all, to make sure that our population and the history of our uh, great population is taught in this country. And that's where I think uh, the problem really is. And we do all that we can. We have a State Advisory Council on Indian Education that produces a, uh, a very good report on Indian education in the state each year. That report comes out of the North Carolina Dep Department of Public Instruction and approved by the State Board of Education. But, uh, you know, we find that a lot of what's in those reports do not gravitate down to each school system. So, I mean, there's, there's opportunities in that report for just about teacher, any teacher at any level to teach a module about American Indians in our state. In fact, uh, the State Advisory Councils have even produced modules that can be taught. There's very little that a teacher would have to do except to go grab it and teach that. So, uh, I would say that's my two cents on that one. Thank you, Greg. There's some great things in the chat too. Uh, Jesse, go ahead. And then uh, Julia, you may be unmuted too. Go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> I'll make mine short, sweet, and simple. Thank you, Greg. That was a good, good speech there. Uh, I, I agree with what they're saying about the, the history, it being taken out of the books and everything. As time goes along, they forget about the Indian because there's no history there for the Indian. And I, would, I do want to say one thing, though, in particular. How do we honor American Indians? We do not honor them with mascots going out there with head dresses on and paint on, how to scalp the Indian. You are not honoring an Indian. You're not honoring nobody. Uh, education as we mentioned before, is, is a prime target, a prime thing for the American, to educate people about the American Indians. Uh, I think as a human being, if we would recognize our own culture and be happy with our own culture, we'd be a lot better off. Uh, I've heard people say, my great-great-grandmother was American Indian or Native American, they call them. Uh, but they have no proof of it. But yet, they won't say nothing about their culture, you know. That that kind of disturbs me a little bit right there alone, because be proud of who you are, regardless of who you are. Be proud of who you are. And uh, But anyway, uh, education is, is going to be the key to anything, and, and especially for the American Indians, to, to get people to know about us. And it's going to be a hard road to get in schools. And there's no, no doubt about that. But it can be done. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for your persistence on this topic. Isabella, you want to sort of close us out here? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that um, seeing Indigenous people doesn't always have to be as big as driving to North Dakota for Standing Rock. Um, like I said, there's plenty of people out there who genuinely think we're extinct. So seeing indigenous people can be as simple as correcting a friend or pointing out something that you think might not be okay or just recognizing indigenous culture when you see it. Whether that be in the media and the arts, supporting indigenous artists is really important. They're really hard to come by. Um, supporting indigenous literature as well is super important. Uh, pretty much anything that preserves the indigenous legacy. Um, that preserves indigenous culture. Thank you, Isabella. I'm enjoying well, this. Oh, yeah, oh. This is Richard. Great. Yep. Uh, one yep. more time here. Um, just wanted to put in one more plug for North Carolina today. We celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day in North Carolina today. We did not celebrate Columbus Day. That's a federal, that's a federal piece. So let's look at again what we're doing here in North Carolina. I'm affiliated with a lot of other state Indian commissions. 
and a, a lot of other states have not moved in that direction. So I, I think North Carolina, here in the, our, our state, we're setting the stage for some bigger and better things. So I think we have a lot to be thankful for. We're not all the, we're not where we need to be yet. And the one piece Jess had mentioned about the honor. I'm a uh, veteran of the U.S. Army, served in Vietnam. Now, uh, there are a number of ways that American Indians are, have been honored in the military. We have fighter jets that were named in, an, uh, in honor of Indian tribes or Indian uh, warriors. That was honor. Putting that name on a fighter jet was an honor in my mind. But putting a, a character fi figure on a sweatshirt or bumper sticker with a face that is all about a, a cartoon figure, to me is not honor. And when you have an institution like the Washington Redskins believing and thinking that's an honor, but then when you look deeply into that honor that they're portraying, did they fund a single scholarship for American Indians? Do they hire any American Indians? So that's all I'll say. You, you, take, you know where I'm going with that. Point taken. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for your presence. Again, some great quotes here in the chat room. Uh, our Native American history is not comprehensive or nuanced. No people's history is only a history of past oppression, but that's a caricatured history. A tourist approach. Black History Month, Indigenous Peoples Day, it goes on and on. Uh, we need a comprehensive history. I fear sometimes I've, I'm thinking about anti-racism training that white history becomes normative history and uh, anything, any other history is sort of uh, what? It's an add-on and an extra, uh, it's not part of the history and that's got to stop. Uh, so thanks to everyone uh, on the panel. I'll turn it back over to Laura or Caroline or Ben. Let me just say what an honor it is to be uh, with the Native American panel that has been with us tonight. I just wish more of the folks who are absolutely convinced that they're on the right side of this issue would have a chance to just listen to some of you and hear your stories, uh, I think things uh, might begin to change. But we got to stay at this, right, Jesse? This is not a sprint. You got it's it. It's a marathon. Okay. All right. Thank you all for your participation in the panel. Thank you so much, everybody. Please continue to follow us on social media and on our website, retiretheredraider.com, so we can keep you updated on additional opportunities. Hey, Have Laura. a wonderful night. Laura. Yes. <laughs> yeah, can you ask anyone on the panel, not the panel, but in, on Zoom, do they have any comments, anything? Yes, does anybody want to, to close out with an additional comment or question? I just wanted to say happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to share um, your experiences. And, um, you know, I actually leave feeling really encouraged because of the information that Greg shared. So I also appreciate that we're in a better place than I thought we were here in North Carolina. Um, I think that the current climate leaves us, um, leaves me feeling, I can't see, leaves me feeling discouraged and that people are so tied, um, that dominant status threat is so real that people are unwilling to let go of these trinkets that they've created. And so I appreciate um, what you shared um, and uh, feel like we're still fighting a good fight. So thanks for that. So I just wanted to say, um, just thank you all um, for being the change that you all want to, to see. I think it's very, very important that we continue to encourage one another because at the end of the day, um, we, we have to stick together and we have to continue to allow one another. Like th this is our mojo, us sticking together and putting ourselves in these groups for uh, being activists. You know, this is, this is we're, we're not the norm, you know? And so we need each other. We need to be able to stand together with one another. So thanks to each of you, you know, no matter the color of your skin, for saying, you know what, right is right and wrong is wrong. And 
it takes bravery and it takes courage and it's hard. It's very, very, very hard to go against the status quo and to go against the norm. So, you know, I appreciate you all for your bravery. Continue to live in your truth and continue to help spread the truth for others that may not have a voice to do so. It has been good to have Greg and others. Let me just repeat one of the stats I've learned. Uh, North Carolina has the largest population of Native Americans of any state east of the Mississippi. Uh, so we talk about invisibility, but it's high time that North Carolina got on board with its Native American uh, citizens. Richard, one final quote from the North Carolina Board of Elections. We're coming up on an election season. We have 122,000 American Indians in our state by the 2010 census. If we go to the Board of Elections database, we have over 56,000 American Indians who are registered to vote in this state. One county, Robertson County, has over 26,000. That means that half of our population basically is very actively involved. Thank you. Let me make that comment. I'd like to say something, uh, Greg, this is Wendy, and we're going to be able to impact uh, people's sight. Um, I'm tired of people thinking of our people as byproducts of history. We were significant contributors to history in this place they call America now. And uh, an indigenous political caucus would really, really uh, cause people to uh, uh, see us, not just uh, court us during the political season. I agree, and uh, let's talk. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. Um, we're really excited to keep this conversation going. And um, thank you for those words of inspiration and uplift at the end um, to get us fired up and ready to continue observing Indigenous Peoples Day every day um, and preparing to move into Native American Heritage Month in November. Um, thank you again, everybody. We will talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night, good night.